Good evening and welcome back. We have got uh, that table that we worked on last time. Uh, there's the base over there and check it out. This is the, the veneer top we made last time. I went ahead and glued it on. What I decided to do with this top was to add an inlay line around the top edge. Actually called a binding, a binding edge. So it'll be laid in right there. You've probably seen this type of detail most often on the edge of an acoustic guitar. It goes around that top of the guitar and down the side and it's quite often it's only about a sixteenth of an inch thick but a little taller than it is thick. We're going to use a line, a solid ebony line and lay it right into that corner. I'll show you that process but you know before I got started to think of putting it in the in this recess we're going to cut, we have to have the ebony lines. And you can buy them uh, pre-made. They're not cheap. They're, they're pretty costly per foot. Or if you happen to have a chunk of wood like this one, you can make your own lines. Now I got this one from our friends at Goose Bay, who, as those of you who have watched, know that they are nearby. Um, it's a lumber store, so they've got all kinds of hardwood lumber. And in the office, they have these exotic blanks that I hardly ever talk about. I got this uh, ebony blank, and from this ebony blank, I'm going to show you today how to make your own lines. This is an inch and a half square by 18 inches long. And this sold for about $45. Ebony is a lot. Okay, you don't have to use ebony. That's the great news. You can use another dark wood that actually gets quite dark. And I've often made lines out of wenge. I've made lines out of walnut, which doesn't hold up the contrast over time because walnut lightens over time. It gets kind of this mellow amber color. So if you're looking for a contrast, you know, you want to pick something that is going to hold up. Now you might have a darker top. And you may want to put in a whiter line. You could put in a curly maple or something like that. Uh, we've done that. So you're not limited to this exotic hardwood. It's nice if you have it, but uh, just use your imagination and don't feel limited by the costs of materials like that. And you can actually buy imitation ebony. It's ebonized lines. They're significantly cheaper. I have done that in the past, but you know, it's noticeably um, softer or it fragmented more. This just has an incredible texture. It's hard, but it has like this waxy feeling to it. And I enjoy turning it and it's just a beautiful wood to work with, but it is hard. Oh, the other species that is commonly used with ebony is Macassar ebony. That's one of the highest uh, other uses that was very popular in the Art Deco period in the 20s because it was very stripey. You know, think mm -hmm. of the guys walking around in their pinstripe suits. And uh, that has like a, a whitish black stripiness or it's, it's kind of like a cream color white stripe. Anyway, um, I'm just going to finish prepping this panel, okay? And then we'll make our line to go in. I sanded everything I just want to smooth this a little bit because I'm going to get it ready to cut the recess. But um, while I have it in my hands here, I did all three sides. I just want to finish this last edge. And I'm going to sand with the grain here because it's, it's a little bit wavy. And before I cut my rabbit, which is just an inside corner around the edge for, for the uh, line to go in, I'm going to make sure I'm smooth here or else it'll leave a bumpy rabbit. Tom, I've did you veneer that um, chair that you showed us? That, uh, that's yes, that's almost veneer. all. Yeah. It's almost all veneer. It's, yes. it's not completely. The back legs are the only element that are not veneered. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you can see a lot of the pieces that Tom has made on our website at our port his portfolio page. It's just epicwoodworking.com slash portfolio. And the chairs that you just saw and others are 
are there. That's right. Let's see historically what he's built a, so a selection of things. By yeah. no means all of them. <laughs> I didn't get a lot of photos of everything, but you know, don't ask me to build any of those for <laughs> for you. I'm not actually taking commissions anymore because you're my main commission these days yes. is passing it on. Amen. All right, so this is all set. This is all smooth, nice and ready for the corner. Now, before I cut the recess, let's go ahead and make some lines. So to make these lines, I already, I didn't want to bother with the joiner tonight, but just know that I've already squared up this one corner on the joiner. So you're going to take the material and square it up. Now when you get some exotic material like this ebony, it comes and it's coated with wax completely. This is like a, it's been dipped in wax. And uh, the ends were too, but I just skinned them off so you could see, I could see that little bit of sapwood. So the sapwood on, on ebony, gaboon ebony, is really white, like creamy white. So that's the only little splash of sapwood. On the other end, there's none. So this is an incredible, really pure gaboon ebony piece. Now, uh, I went ahead and jointed or flattened one surface. Then I put that surface against the fence, ran it over my joiner again with the fence at 90 degrees. So I created a 90 degree corner like this. And it's true 90 all the way and it's nice and straight. So to get a stick like this, first I'm going to cut it into one thinner piece, like the full height of this. And then I'll flip that thin piece on its side and cut into skinny strips like this. But what we want to do is control that corner and make sure we end up with a nice right angle because we're going to inlay it into a little recess around our table top. So I want to control this material nicely. Now, when you saw a $150 board foot wood, <laughs> you don't want to use a big fat table saw blade. You know, if I ran this through my eighth inch uh, table, <laughs> my uh, carbide tip table saw blade, like the Ridge carbide or the Forest, you know, those all leave a, an eighth inch kerf. So I'm going to lose that. I make a few cuts. I've lost a hundred bucks. <laughs> but no, we're not going to do that. We're going to make these cuts more civilized also. <laughs> we're going to do it on the bandsaw. And I'm going to use the smaller bandsaw so that my kerf is small. It's actually, we'll measure it after I make a cut or when we get to, I think it's, it's le a little less than a sixteenth. So we're not going to lose much material that way and we're going to have a nice safe cut. I'm going to make these lines that go into the edge. I want them to finish at a 330 seconds by 330 seconds. So my recess that I cut into the table is 330 seconds. Now the line I have in the table is an eighth inch wide. So you may say, why are you making it 330 seconds? Why not an eighth? If you did an eighth of an inch, it would look almost three sixteenths on the diagonal. Okay, so that looks fat. When you use a three thirty second by three thirty second, it reads on the edge like an eighth or a little fuller than an eighth. So to make this cut, in order to make it, I first set up the saw and I wanted to set this just slightly more than my three thirty second. I don't want to waste it any material, right? So I already did that. Now, here's a little tip for when you're cutting thin things. Like it's not thin yet, but once we cut that first piece off, then we're going to lay it over and we're going to start cutting in strips. It will get thinner. You want to support the outcut. Now see that gap around this bandsaw blade? I got this little insert in the, ta in the bandsaw and it's pretty roomy right around the front. What you want to do is have what's called a zero clearance kind of table, which just means there's zero clearance <laughs> around the blade. Yeah, it means you, you're going to put a fresh kind of base there and have the blade so that there's 
really hardly any gap all around the cutting edge. In that way, when you run and cut your material, you're not going to get the splintering out underneath. This is unsupported, so there's greater potential for splintering. We can't have any of that because we're trying to cut clean, little, delicate corners here. Now, the same holds true on the table saw. If you were doing this on the table saw and you're trying to get a really clean exit cut, like let's say you're cutting something more fragile and delicate like uh, veneer or thin material like this, you would want to put a zero clearance insert into your table saw. And sometimes you have to make a fresh one and just bring the blade up through it. Now, I'm not going to go and make a new insert right now. That would take too long and it's hard to do. So one little trick you can do is just use a piece of plywood like this. And I'm going to send this in as a cut. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to shut it off and I'm going to pin this and just clamp it right to the table. So now I've created this little auxiliary table with, Brilliant. A, with a zero clearance. The bandsaw blade that I have running on the saw most of the time is a 3 8 with a 6 teeth per inch or TPI. So and I get these from Timberwolf, but you can, there's a lot of good ones out there. I've got it all set up now. I, I adjusted my guides and everything before I started doing this, so I would know I would have this running well. And if you want to see that, we do have another video. I think it's called Tuning Your Bandsaw, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that was just all about setting up this saw to perform its best. So it's all set up to do that, and now I'm just going to make that cut. So I've got my nice clean surface. So let me turn on the dust collector and here we go. But look at that. Look at how this is a nicely tuned bandsaw right now. So those, you can see those little marks, but they're fairly smooth for a bandsaw. And here's my jointed side. So much more polished there, right? And this is my nicely jointed edge. So I've got already a nicely smooth right angle corner right there with the jointed edge. So I'm ready actually to just flip this and now I can make my secondary cut to get my little heavier than 330 seconds square. So let's go ahead. If I measure this, it's just shy of an eighth of an inch. I like this little thing. It, you see me maybe mention it. This was a new one by Woodpeckers, uh, I think it was at least a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. They call it the hook rule. And what's nice is you don't have to like go, oh, let me try to get that right on the edge. It just hooks and it indexes perfectly so you can read it quickly. So anyway, there you go. We've got our material. Now I've got everything set up. I'm just ready to go. I want to reestablish a nice jointed edge here, and I want it to be 90 degrees to the surface. Now you're dealing with thin stuff here, and when you go to the joiner, it's a little hairy. Another thing I meant to mention, if your bandsaw is cutting heavy or whatever, you're not, I'm going to just use this as it is, okay? I've got bandsaw marks on two corners, 
But those are going to be the outside corners and those are heavy so those are going to get shaved down flush with the top and the side edge so I don't care that they're rough right now. I want those inside corners to be smooth so I don't have any gappiness when I clamp it up. I mean that's so smooth pretty much with the bandsaw it probably wouldn't even show but uh, you know I don't usually go on the bandsaw side. You're going to get a better glue joint and everything if you use the jointed edge. Now if you are so fortunate that you have a drum sander or some kind of uh, wide belt sander, then have fun and sand them. I, I usually, in fact, that's what I do a lot of times, I'll just run a bunch of these sticks and then you could sand them both sides and get them down to even a little thinner. And you, it's like you're making your own veneer, you know, your thick veneer. Then you edge them and you start cutting your little strips. So you'll only have one edge in that case that has the roughness but if that's what you're you need you know but here we can go ahead and I don't I want to show you if you don't have a drum sander you don't need one to to make these lines just as I'm doing here okay but now instead of going to the joiner and risking our precious fingertips we're gonna go over to the over to the bench Tom what about a shooting board would that be a way of that's a good question so that would be a way um, we could s press this onto a shooting board but after you start cutting these what you end up with is before you know it you're pretty narrow and your challenge is holding this so you can shoot past it you could rig up something uh, so yeah you can rig up a shooting board to work for you here I'm going to show you a variation on that take your pick you know whatever you want so uh, for this I'm gonna use a joiner plane the big old joiner that is usually on the top of the tool cabinet and I'm gonna set it upside down into my vise so this is what you often do you know when you have a small workpiece and it's harder to hold it in a position to, to work it you you hold the workpiece and you clamp the plane instead of the workpiece so but we need we want to make sure that we're square here here so one little thing you can put on your own little homemade auxiliary fence so this edge is square to this edge so that's going to be my little riser fence I'm just going to set that on there and cover about half the blade and then I'll just pop a couple clamps on here and hold this this is like fixing my fence so now I have a joiner plane in the vise and this is much safer than going over to the actual joiner so this is the only dangerous spot um, but I'm gonna be careful as I go by that so here's my my freshly bandsawed edge so I'm gonna hold this vertically like this and I'm just gonna feed it right in nice and smooth like that see don't wiggle at all <laughs> that's, right, that's two three oh now do you hear it I think it was by the fourth one I could just hear it smooth the first two or three it was I was hearing chattering because it was actually removing that bumpiness now I have a gorgeous jointed edge there and if I put the square up to it <laughs> this is so small it's you know what it's gonna be it's gonna be perfect no it is perfect we're not surprised so see how civilized this is plus you don't have to keep turning on the joiner you don't have all that noise you would have your little bandsaw close by I'm gonna skim here and I could advance that a little and take a little more off and maybe maybe you can dial it so you can do it in two passes that would be awesome all right so let's go ahead back over to the bandsaw all right let's make okay. one more line yep. and then we're going to start inlaying I'll show you a little bit of inlay this curve is 3 64ths so we're a 64th less than a 16th but when I measure the entire amount it takes me to get one line so my, the line plus the curve is yeah it's uh, 530 seconds okay so 
if we measured across this whole board, we're going to get 8, 9, 10. So that's, that's 10 lines on this one piece. And then this other piece, we would get another 8, 9, 10. So we'd get 10. We would get over 100 lines from this one chunk. So it's not bad if you check out what they cost. So from a $45 piece, you can get well over 100 lines 18 inches long. So let's go ahead and just uh, finish this one. I got this set up, so I'm going to just do this because I, I want to see if I can do it without wobbling this time. But I made the fence pretty low so that I could keep going and get narrower and narrower. So that's it. So I've got, I would just keep going with this setup and until I had all the lines I wanted. Sometimes if it's a larger project, you know, you might just, while you have it set up, go ahead and create a whole lot so you're, you're good to go with whatever material you choose. Because sometimes the setup of it it's so time consuming, or is really where a lot of time is, so that to knock them out, you might as well make a few extra when you can. All right, so there we go. We've got our lines, and now we are going to put them into our table. And I'll probably just throw a couple in to show you this. So we're all smooth around the sides, and now we've got to cut our recess that we we want to make a 30 second by 30 second. I do want to point out one thing that's quite satisfying. If you look at the quality of that glue joint or that, that joint with the, you're seeing a slight shadow there. Um, these, these are really crisp. Look right on over here, like how, how tight that is. And this is just right off of the veneer saw. If you ever doubted the quality of a veneer saw joint. So, there's lots of ways to cut edges for, for uh, veneer. You can stack them between boards and you can, you can route them. You can actually saw across and you'll get a really fine edge, but you've got to really uh, put pressure on this thin wood so it doesn't flutter and fracture. So you've got to figure out a way to support the material, much like we did with that zero clearance on the bandsaw. All right, so here we go. We're going to cut our little wrap it and put in a couple lines. I already set the router with the rabbiting bit. This is from CMT, but it comes with a bunch of different uh, bearings. So you get one bearing that's the full width that gives you a flush cut with that bearing and you just change out the bearings. This is the, they have a 16th inch smaller and then an eighth inch smaller. So this is the eighth inch smaller, and I just put some tape around it to expand it to give me that 332nd. I could do a regular pull cut, but I'm gonna do a climb cut um, to try to preserve this material. Zebra wood is kind of fibrous, and it will wanna tear a little bit. reposition this and here we finish this up
now we've got our little rabbit cut there. And you end up always with like a little fuzz right on the top when you have this end grain coming out like this. So I'm gonna go around and just holding this 150 flat, sand in the direction of the grain. I don't wanna cross grain sand here. And just sort of, by doing that, I'm just lightly breaking the edge of the fibers there on the corner. We want a clean edge to lay that uh, line in against. So this is just something that quite often occurs when you route. Can you um, address again why you did the climb cut? Um, yeah, this this is interesting because, well, it's more of an issue for the vertical grain on the bottom. So when the router bit is turning, think of it spinning this way. It's, it's clockwise as you look down on it. So the cutter is a straight edge and it's sweeping in this way and it's making that cut, okay? So it actually is fine on the top edge. It's this bottom edge that you have to be careful with. So if I pull the router in this direction, that edge is, is coming in and it's lifting out what's in front of it here, okay? So it's wanting to lift everything out. So if you climb cut and you only, you're gonna go actually in the same direction as the curve. So instead of bringing it this way, where that cutting edge is lifting out like this, you're going to come this way. So the actual lead cut is cutting down into the material. So by the time it gets on this side, when it could lift, it's already gone. So you gotta just think about the orientation of that particular wood. Um, for the other grain, it's not as big a deal, but it is making, it is cutting in here, but you will tend to get a smoother cut when you climb cut. However, be warned, it only works when you're doing a light kind of cut. So if you're taking a heavier cut, you, climb cutting is not always an option because when you go to climb cut, the, the router will want to jump and run away because you're not giving any kind of force against the direction of the spin. So it's only when you have control of the router and you have a light cut can you actually go in the direction of the spin, like push along in that same direction. So that just, it just favors to get result in a cleaner edge. But it depends on the orientation of the grain and all that. Uh, but you run into it a lot on... Um, circular tops of solid wood where you want to be careful. Now, I'm holding the paper. I just folded it tight against itself so I get a little bit of an edge. I'm just going to throw it down that edge to clean off that fuzz. So that fuzz that was really high on that top is now almost completely gone. It's gone enough to get the lines in there without disturbance from that. It was pretty fuzzy there along the edge. But fortunately it didn't tear out. It's a nice clean cut. All right, so now we're ready to put our lines in. I'm gonna bring over one that I just cut here. And let's, let's set this over here. I'm actually gonna bring up my shooting board just in case we need it. I'll set it right there. This is a shooting board that's set up with a 45 right now. This 45 triangle can actually be removed and you'd have a 90 degree cut. You may be saying, wow, where can I get a shooting board like that? <laughs> well, let me tell you, we actually made a video on that. So we're gonna put a link to that too. That's also another uh, Shop Night Live free video that you can check out. Uh, this is a, a little, 45 degree miter we're going to use on the corners. It's so small, it's really forgiving, but it does help just to adjust the length pretty fast using this if you have one. I'm going to use, make sure that I've got the smooth inside corner 
resting against the material. That feels good. I'm a little proud on the top and on the edge, which is what we wanted. So I'm going to make a miter cut like that, right on that end. And so I'll come over to this board. I have made these little miter stations. You can custom make by cutting that groove and cutting across. But you really don't have to go to that length if you just have a combination square that has a 45 degree end on it. You come up to it. Now you can just chop down with a chisel, but with wood like ebony, it wants to fracture and sometimes it can get kind of messy. So if I just come in here, hold my pressure now, I've got this up against the, I'm going to take this Japanese saw and just lightly, I know it's moving a little there, I'm not worried about that. I'm just trying to get it. So there, I've got a pretty good 45. If I want to make sure it's a true 45, I'm going to put it in my shooting board here and clean it up a little bit. Okay, see those little cuts up the end? So there you go. Now we can check it back with our board. And see, I'm going to just register it right on the corner there. Now I'm going to hold pressure and come right now to this miter right here. I'm going to take my marking knife and just make a nice little score line like that. With this ebony, you've got to do it a couple times or you won't ever see it. Okay, there we go. I'll come back over to my makeshift miter station and I'm going to set this just proud of that line and pin it down, hold pressure with your square and get back to my Japanese saw. Yeah, let's see how that looks. Now, you know, if it doesn't, if you cut it too short, this is a square, so it's gonna probably be too short all around, so you won't be able to use it, but um, hey, you got more. You know how to make it now, so no big deal. That looks almost perfect. I'm just gonna clean it up, so I'm gonna flip it over. I can do all these from the same right-hand side. I'll just flip it over, and that should be good. Let's check it again. This first one, you really want to, you got to pay attention to two ends. So I'm setting that right. And then that looks great. All right, so I'm just going to put a clamp on my board right here. And let's get our big glue bottle out. And our green tape. This is Scotch uh, 233 Plus. I'm trying to use this tape as a clamp. So this is going to be taping the corner. You could use re regular masking tape, but this has a little more of a stretch factor and it's tougher. It won't break across that fairly sharp edge when you're pulling it because you're just going to give a little pull pressure. It doesn't take a ton of pressure, but it's enough that it's nice to have that green tape to do the job. It's like a clamping tape. All right, so we're going to just get a tiny tiny amount in here. Nice little bead. I'm going to give you some questions while you're doing that. Is that all right? Sure. Uh, would you use the same tools for Mother of Pearl that you use on Ebony? Um, no. Um, Mother of Pearl is, it's just a different, <laughs> it's a different material, right? I mean, it's not wood, so it doesn't have wood grain, you're dealing with a shell, you know, actual from a shellfish. And it, um, so it's hard. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of cutting Mother of Pearl. So I get this pressured into the inside corner. You can see some nice squeeze out all along. I had to line it up nicely and now I can tape away. So I want to get one right near the corner. I'm going to stretch and pressure and pin it and then come a few inches you know, two or three inches. Depends how thick the corner is because, you know, if you can push here and see more squeeze out, then your tape is too far apart. So 
about like this is good for this. Stretch, pull, nice pressure. This is like so fast. I love how quickly you can lay in a really nice decorative line with this method because you're using tape. You don't have to worry about messing with clamps and all that. So once you get that corner set, then you flip around. We'll get another one. So let me go ahead and uh, get the next one. We've got a nice smooth edge, smooth and I've got, there's my, so I'm gonna be over here again. I know I want that inside cut again. I think I'll just do this one more and show you the end. You know, I was thinking, every time I do a little makeshift project like this on Shop Night Live, sometimes they turn into projects. Like, I don't know that we need to do the, another table like this, but let's go ahead and throw this in here. But if you think you'd like to see a project like this, make suggestions, you know. Um, we could add projects down the road. You mean you're referring to an online course? Yeah, an online yeah. Course, yeah, course, yeah, where we could actually go in-depth and you'd really be see every little nuance. So I'm holding it snug there, and I'm going to come down to the other end again. And this is pretty much the way you'd work around the table. Take my marking knife, come right into that miter line I see here and make a nice little score and I'm making it right in line with that so I'm even if, if you make it make it even slightly outside of that line so you give yourself a little bit to shoot off if you need to it's hard to make it longer <laughs> Tom if uh, they were to use the router table would they climb cut there as well um, you could, but you have to be careful because you're holding the workpiece and, you know, that's like, you don't get a second chance. If it's too thick to climb cut, it's going to take off and throw the piece. So I would probably just go conventional there. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's see how this works. Let's pretend you were to make a mistake on the miter joint okay. would you fix that with ebony dust and ca glue oh if there was a gap well i only if i glued it on with a gap at the corner that's almost this is going to just need one quick little shoot to clean it up and we'll be perfect i put more glue in this one it's going to be a little mess here all right i'm going to go ahead and tape this in i got it nice and snug on the corner here we go again all right, so that's how I'd go ahead. And once you get all around, you're going to have something that looks like that. Bon appetit. <laughs> all right, so there we go. We've got a nice little top. And now when I feel this, I can, I, it's a little proud there. Let me just quickly, I'm going to show you just one little edge. To do the edge here, I could use a router, but... Usually I try to bring the, the ebony down first. So it's up a little high here. So if I rest it like that, the cutting edge is resting up on that piece. So we start moving. Can you see down mm -hmm. here now? You can hear it, it's, it's, it's like waxy. You can see the remnants there. <laughs> yeah, and then you can go right around the corner. This is fun like to do when you're, I'm taking kind of a small cut. I could be a little more aggressive, but I just want to get it close and then I would card scrape down. Look how beautifully this card scrapes. It, it's kind of waxy so it comes off in that, that kind of stringiness. It's just a different kind of grain. And then um, along this edge, I could use um, just a flush router bit. So I prefer that on the edge because I don't want to be, you know, with the grain of the 
zebra wood running perpendicular. Now I just have to card scrape lightly and then sand. And then I'm going to break the edge softly like we've done on some other ones. So that's going to be slightly radiused. Soften those corners a little. And then you're going to set it back on your table base. And you've changed the game. So this line here ends up setting it off. Now that's going to look thinner. It's going to look, after I clean it up, it's looking heavy. And that's what I was telling you about. Why I prefer a 332nd line. It's going to be a little cleaner and, and more refined than that line. So the thoughts coming up about putting another banding around the bottom. Okay. Oh, I'm glad somebody mentioned that. Yeah. When I've done that before, I've, I mean, I've looked at it and said, uh, it was too much. I like the way that when you put one, it almost looks like a shadow because you don't see the line as much. When you put a line on the bottom edge, it gets lost like a shadow almost, but against here, you'd probably see it better. But too much of a good thing is not always a good thing. You know, so it's, it's kind of restraint of how many lines do you want on here? We've got three going right now. So another one, to me personally, I have done it with um, mahogany tables or whatever, and it looks like too much. Because plus when you put it on there, it, it makes the edge of the top appear even thinner. So you'd be taking another dimension away from that. And so that little vertical grain becomes quite short. And you know, you could plan ahead. Even when I've done it on three quarter inch thick top, I felt like the grain, vertical grain between started to look too short. And it was like, eh, you know what? Didn't really need that line. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like if you don't, it's totally up to you to try it, but I, after you finish, tell me what you think. I mean, but it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? You might love it, mm -hmm. but I've been there. I think it's just too much of a good thing on a thing like this because we've got enough going on here. We've got that nice cuffed foot, the line under the apron, and then on the corner. This is the main one because this serves that protective purpose as well as being decorative. Under here, not so important to protect it. It's on there well. It doesn't get abused there. And then you've got that nice decorative line around the field to make a nice distinction between the transition from the quilted maple to the zebra wood border. Any Sounds other questions? Good. No more questions. I think we're all good. right, everybody. I think I got them all. Hey, once again, if you enjoyed this content, we'd love you to be a subscriber. It helps our us grow and deliver even better content as we go along, check out our website at epicwoodworking.com. You can get a lot of other content over there. Thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight in the shop. Really enjoyed it. Look forward to seeing you next time.